I'm from Speaker Series India at Berkeley. I'm a second year undergraduate student here studying computer science and data science. And I am joined by my co-interviewer, Shivi. Shivi, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Shivi Jain. I'm also a sophomore. I'm also studying computer science and data science. Yeah. Nice. I think that's what we need. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming to this event that we're calling the Ace of AI. We were always wanting to invite Professor Sahai for an event. I think Speaker Series was discussing this about a year ago, that uh, we have such cool people at Berkeley who teach at Berkeley. They also do cool things outside Berkeley. And we were wondering, we have to make use of this. We have to learn from them, bring them for an event. and. Finally, that's happening, so we are very happy. Uh, before we begin, we would like to thank our collaborating clubs. Firstly, Data Science Society, a big, huge a round of applause for Data Science Society. <laughs> our second collaborating club, Data Good at Berkeley. <laughs> and uh, Speaker Series India at Berkeley is advised by the Institute of South Asia Studies. So. All our events, we get, we are advised by them. They also give us funding, so why not? We have to clap for them, sir, right? Uh, yes. Before we begin, once again, thank you so much for coming. I, I hope, we, I'm pretty sure this room will be full in the next 10 minutes as people start trickling in. And I will hand it over to Shivi to introduce our speaker. Yeah, okay, so. Our speaker for today is Professor Swapnil Sahai. A lot of you guys in this room might know him as the co-instructor for Data Ace, the largest undergraduate course in the world. For data science, yes. Yes, for, for <laughs> data science. Um, he's also the co-founder and CEO of Spring Vision, uh, which is an AI-based mobile company which deals with uh, uh, shot tracking, uh, video analysis, of an officiating tennis matches. Um, he's also a Berkeley alum, and during his time at Berkeley, he triple majored in economics, applied math, and statistics, while minoring in Chinese studies. So that's really cool. And he also worked in Tesla, specifically in Tesla Autopilot for object tracking. So today we're just gonna talk about Swing Vision and his journey in like to be who he is today. So let's please like, give a round of applause for <laughs> Professor Sahai. Yeah, good to see you all. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming, Professor Sahai. We, to start off, we want to ask you, uh, how did you come about with the idea of Swing Vision? And essentially that ideation stage, the aha moment, what led to Swing Vision? Um, yeah, I mean, it was a while back, I guess. Uh, I was in grad school, so I went to Columbia for grad school, so I was out in New York at the time. Um, and yeah, I guess I've also been a lifelong tennis and basketball player, so those are my main sports. Uh, and I just wanted a way to track my game. Like, it was pretty much just like a selfish thing. Like, I was just like, hey, I want some stats on my game. And there was no technology out there, no product that let me do that. Um, and, I, and I saw that like there was apps like Strava or All Trails, which you guys may have used. You know, you can track your runs and your cycling, mm -hmm. uh, but there was nothing like that for like ball and racket sports. So that was the initial idea. I was like, hey, I'd love to just get stats on my game, uh, but I didn't really know how that was even possible. It sounded like a pretty hard problem. Mm -hmm. um, so the first thing I did was uh, around this was like around 2015, the Apple Watch came out, and so I thought, oh, maybe I can make an app on my watch to like track my game manually. So that was the first thing we made actually, it was like an app for the watch where you could like just manually like keep score with like swipe gestures. And it was like, you know, kind of gimmicky, like no one really wants to be like inputting a bunch of stuff like while you're playing a game. But it turned out that a lot of people actually started using it. Um, and so we actually started to get like this customer base that was like growing. And then the number one feedback we got after like a year was like, can you just automate this? Like I don't want to have to be like tapping stuff on my watch all right. the time. So then that's how like Swing Vision was born. Um, but it was, it was over a series of steps. It was like a side project, a hobby just for myself. But then slowly like started to become a company, I guess, over time. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, so one thing that we were wondering while researching about you was back in your undergrad days at Berkeley, you didn't take many CS classes. Is, is that yeah. true? So yeah, that's true. How did someone <laughs> who didn't take any or many CS classes at Berkeley 
yeah. come up with this idea and maybe how did you progress in your proficiency in CS? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, that was probably like the worst thing I did, which is to not take a CS class while I was at Berkeley. Like Professor De Niro, like all these great people I could have taken from them, I didn't. Um, oh. So yeah, I just like did not, for some reason, did not do any CS. I was just like math and econ, like that was my thing. Um, but yeah, I think once I went to grad school, I was trying to just find internships. And that's where I saw like, okay, if I want to be a data scientist, I need to know like a little bit of coding. So I took like a intro class in like data structures probably when I was at Columbia. So it was an undergrad class. So I was like one of the gra few grad students in that class. Mm -hmm. But I knew like I needed to have some basic foundations. Um, then I interned for a startup called Namely, um, which is now a bigger company. It's like an HR company. So I interned for them out in New York uh, and we were doing some like very basic like Python related data science stuff. So I think just like on the job, I started to just pick it up. And then finally, I got the internship at Tesla as a data science intern. And that's really where that summer, like I think my CS knowledge like expanded pretty significantly. And then also around the same time, I was starting to work on the first version of Stream Vision as well. Um, this is like, again, back in like 2016 or something. Um, so yeah, kind of both of those, just kind of like building my own app from scratch, uh, forcing myself to learn it. I think that kind of pushed me over. But yeah, I didn't really take like a lot of classes. So I think like all of you guys are way more qualified than I am, than I was at that time. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Just like, I think just like projects, I guess, is the best way to learn it. And that's kind of what I went through. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, continuing from that, as you mentioned, like you started uh, like developing Spring Vision while you were in college and like getting into the tech line and stuff. So a lot of college students here also like have startup ideas, but a lot of them fail. And like yours was successful, clearly. <laughs> you have Andy Broderick <laughs> investing and really big investors. Yeah, we'll, really we'll get to that later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how could you like describe how you made this from a idea to a product, like that process? Um yeah, I mean, first of all, like it's a very it's I mean the we'll we'll see what happens to the company in the future. I don't know where it's gonna go, but like uh, we've done decently well so far, but it's it's taken a while to get here, you know, over several years. So I think all startups move at like different paces and all that. It was for us as a side project for like many years before we actually did it full time. I mean, we started working on it like 2016. I didn't start working full time on it till 2019. Right. So that's like three years of it just being like a hobby. So I think everybody, you know, different different pace, w what they want to progress on. Um, but yeah, we just just kind of had the idea and like it didn't exist we just wanted the product to exist so we just started like making it mm -hmm. uh, my co-founder and i we like started coding it up like in the evenings and in the, in the weekends um and just like put together something and then once we felt like it was good enough we just launched on the app store um took us probably about a year from like the first coding it to like launching it um we probably could have shipped it like way sooner than that but we were like perfectionists and we wanted to like make sure it works really well and looks really nice uh, which is actually a mistake. You can ship stuff way sooner than that. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I think like for a lot of people, it's just like there's like an initial barrier. It's like, oh, I, I don't know like what this is going to be. Like what, what do I need to make? It seems very intimidating. But just like write that first line of code, like just get started, draw that first design. Like once you get over the inertia, then like it gets much faster. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, but I think like for us too, it's interesting because my co-founder and I both, we were super risk averse. Like we don't like taking risks at all. Um, so we didn't feel the conviction to like go and do a startup. For us, it, it was started out as like, let's just do this as like a side project and like make a app out of it. And then like just put it out in the world and see what happens. And then as we got the feedback, then we started to build the conviction like, oh, actually there is a market here. There is demand for our product. Like let's actually go make it a, a business. Um, so, you know, it took us a while to get to that point. Um, but. I would say like you don't have to feel the pressure to like go like start a company right away. Maybe just like a product or like just like a basic little thing and like just validate it with like your friends or just other people you know like in your target market. And then, you know, it can come down the road. Like don't have to rush into it, I guess is what I would say. And that's that's what we did. We took our time with it. So Okay, yeah. yeah. That's that's pretty great, like <laughs> the whole process. Um you you also mentioned, right, because you worked at Tesla and like this was ongoing back then. Um, how did, like, what was your experience at Tesla like? And how did it help you with Swing Vision? Um, yeah, it, the Tesla experience was very interesting. Um, it was uh, very intense, a lot of long hours. Um, 
but I enjoyed it. I loved it. I loved every second of it. Uh, for me, that's like, I mean, again, it's everybody's different, but like, I really enjoyed that culture. Like, it was like all about the product, all about the work. Um, I was an autopilot, so we were like very close with Elon. We met with Elon every week. I presented to him every week. Um, I was in meetings with him, like had mm -hmm. discussions with him. It was amazing. At least back then, I don't know, he's changed a little bit. But, um, <laughs> but at the time, it was like you're working with like the Steve Jobs of your generation, right? So like that was amazing to, to learn from him. I, I think he's, I still think he's a great like CEO of that company. No comment on the other companies. Um, but uh, um, so yeah, no, that, so that was, that was excellent. That was awesome to like be close to him and learn from him. And just that team too, like you could tell that this team was like something special. Like this is like the first iPhones, like the first self-driving solution. Like it's a really special team. Like all those people are so brilliant. Um, so I love that. I think I just love being like, in my opinion, like the dumbest person in the room because I was just like learning from everybody. So I love that. Um, and we were just moving so fast. Like it was so fun. Like we would, we'd like write code in the day and then you would just like public, like push it onto the car and then you just like borrow a car and take it home and you're just like driving your code home. It was just incredible. Like, where else could you do that? It was so cool. And um, so that was super fun. Um, so yeah, no, overall, it was great. I recommend, um, well, at least back then. Wonderful. <laughs> so uh, looking at the tennis racket there on the graphic, we, I'm very eager to dive deep into what Swing Vision is doing. Uh, just to take a step back for people who may not understand tennis or are not so in-depth into you know, CS, data science, computer vision yeah. stuff, how would you describe Swing Vision to them? Um, yeah, well, I mean, if you've played like any sport, hopefully it's, it's like somewhat relatable, but um, it's basically just like a way to get stats about your game and get like highlights, essentially. That's, those are like the two main things that's doing today. Um, and so all you do is like you put up your phone, put it on a tripod, and then the camera on your phone um, will automatically like track you, track all the players like on the court, and it'll generate like stats for everybody in terms of like whatever metric is important for your sport, um, right? So if you imagine like if it's, if it's like baseball, maybe it's like the speed of um, your pitch when you're, when you're throwing the ball. Right. Um, you know, if it's basketball, maybe it's like the release angle, like when I shoot the shot, like what's the angle that it's coming off my hands? So like those are the kinds of metrics that might be interesting mm -hmm. or important in, in, in whatever sport you play. And so for tennis, it's like the speed of the ball. It's um, where is the ball landing? Is it in? Is it out? Uh, can you generate like a chart of like where all the balls are landing throughout the entire match. So that's kind of what it does. Um, and it just does it automatically with your phone. So it's really the first solution, I think, in any sport to do this with a single camera. That's the most revolutionary thing about this. So prior to Swing Vision, in any sport, you need multiple cameras to do this. You have to set up like 10 cameras around the court. You have to like triangulate the position of the ball. Um, it's very expensive, tens of thousands of dollars, uh, not accessible to anybody really, other than if you're like a professional athlete. So Swing Vision is basically the first solution that takes that 10 camera system and puts it into your iPhone. And it's just like one iPhone and you can track all the same stuff. It's not the same accuracy as like a professional level mm -hmm. solution, but it's kind of good enough for consumers. Um, so that's essentially what it is. Yeah. So uh, the process of maybe reducing the work, not reducing, but taking the work of 10 cameras, yeah. making it into one, simplifying the process for the end user, in that vein, I wanted to ask you, when you first thought of Swing Vision and when, maybe when the MVP came, uh, what was the target audience then? And mm. was, what was the MVP targeted for? Was it pro players? Was it the club level, the rookie in the court nearby? Who was that? <laughs> yeah, um, I'd say it was just the target audience was like me and like my friends. <laughs> okay. So just kind of like casual athletes, uh, you know, somebody who maybe just like plays a few times a week, maybe on the weekends. Maybe you play tournaments here and there, but you're not like so serious. So this was definitely not targeted at pros. It was like individual consumers. And it's just like people who play actively. And you could apply this to anything. It's similar to like Strava. Like Strava is targeting that like weekly active uh, cycler, right? So it's a similar kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so you're just like, you're playing your sport at least once a week. That's kind of the target market, which is very broad actually. Um, that's true. But that's what we were targeting for. And then it turned out the app did really well with like adults. So like 25 to like 55 years old. It's a big range for tennis, but yeah. that was like where the app did the best um, initially because those are the people who have the capacity to like spend money on a solution like this. They're playing pretty avidly. They want to improve their game. So that's kind of where it ended up resonating. Um, Understood. Yeah. So you did mention a lot of metrics like speed and position of the ball when it lands on yep. the court. 
uh, I was wondering when I look at a tennis match, I can think of maybe a million metrics that I would want to track. Yes. How do you narrow yeah. down so many possible analytics into the ones that are really useful for a tennis player? Yeah, that was a big challenge and it's still a challenge today. Like in any sport, there's just like so many stats you could track. Um, one big decision we made early on was like, do we want to do like very sophisticated analysis of like the body and the mm -hmm. player and, and the form? Or do we want to just focus on the ball? Um, and so for tennis specifically, we felt like it would be much better to invest a lot of time perfecting ball tracking because not only would it get you stats, it would also solve the biggest problem in tennis, which is line calling. So like calling the ball in or out, it's very unique in tennis. You don't have umpires. It's just players calling it all the way up to like division one tennis. Like literally if the Berkeley team is playing, it's mm -hmm. the players that are refereeing yes. their own matches, which makes no sense. Um, and so that's why we felt like that's such a big problem that if we could perfect ball tracking, then we'd be able to solve uh, we'd be able to solve that massive problem in addition to like all the stat stuff that like all the consumers want. So that was like one decision we made early on was just like looking at what's gonna have um, the biggest impact on the market and what's gonna solve like the most painful problems in the sport. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like how we like just focus on like ball tracking. Like of course there's all kinds of cool things you can do with like pose estimation and all that, but we just toss that all aside and said, just focus on the ball, make that work really well and you're gonna solve like a really big problem here. Um, and hopefully get like a lot of customers. So that's kind of like how we approach it. And that's how we continue to approach it. So like even today, you know, you get people saying like, oh, I'd love to be able to analyze my technique and all this stuff. But I think you really have to focus on like what is gonna like have the biggest impact on the business and like the customer base. Mm -hmm. So to kind of take like all those things into account. Um, but it's hard, like you're just, a lot of these decisions aren't really data driven. Like they're kind of data driven, but it's also just like a gut feel. Like I kind of feel like this is gonna be bigger than this other thing. But I think you want to at least find some way to like quantify it so you can make a decision. Um, but yeah, kind of a long nice. answer. So was it in, in the initial days a very singular focus on ball tracking and perfect that? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean the first, so like when, when we kind of did the pivot from like the watch app to like the phone, right. um, the first like six months of that was just just ball tracking and just like going out, recording a bunch of footage, scraping a bunch of footage from YouTube. Uh, whatever we could find online and just like labeling that labeling the ball in a bunch of different cases and like just focusing on that um, And honestly like that's been the main focus the last four years Like we still have not really done that much on the player tracking even though like okay. that's a very Easily solved problem at this point like pose estimation is like super easy to solve now mm -hmm. But we still just like do not focus on that because we really want to make sure we're the best in the world at the ball tracking um, So yeah, I think that's like the kind of focus you need at least in the early days so that you can just build like the best thing possible. So um, you did mention labeled data. And yeah. I was wondering in the initial days, it, what, how hard was it to get high quality labeled training data to run on all the machine learning models you were building? Yeah, so for this problem, it was impossible because there okay. was no data. There wasn't any. Okay. There wasn't any. Like if you're trying to build a data set for like classifying like cars versus pedestrians or something, there's like millions of data points in the, you know, online mm -hmm. that you could find for that. For our problem, there was nothing. So we had to start from scratch. So we collected our own data. We went out and just like literally just went out to tennis courts around the Bay Area, just like recorded a bunch of random people. Wow. <laughs> um, and then we just w went on YouTube and searched for, because people, there was like a little bit of a tennis culture where people would like upload their matches on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So we just went and found like random people's matches on YouTube, just like downloaded it without their permission. And then we went and did, um, and then we went and found like professional matches. So there's like you know there's like pro match highlights, like literally like a Federer match. Like oh. find a find a highlight on YouTube, download that, label that. So just like all kinds of footage as diverse as we could get. That's what we did, and okay. that's actually kind of what we continue to do. But at this point, we have so many customers, we just get footage from customers. But in the early days, that's kind of what we did, and um, so we just downloaded all that data ourselves, and then we like had a team of labelers that were actually like just labeling everything. Ooh, and that's okay. that's still there today. So all that's, yeah, that's like the whole process for us at least. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think related to artificial intelligence again in sports, I think, or in any field, I'd say there's like always the question of bias. And you mentioned like you collected your own data and you take data from yeah. like YouTube Good and point. like, um, just like people send their videos but just like could you describe what is the bias in your model and like how you are like trying to deal with that uncertainty yeah that's a good question i mean i think for 
for our problem, the some of the bias was like the fact that we were only collecting data in California. So you're gonna get like certain, I guess like court colors and like surfaces. Mm -hmm. So for example, like in Europe, it's very popular to play on clay, which is completely different than like a hard court that we have here in the US. So, you know, we don't have like a lot of examples of that. Um, grass also to a lesser extent. So there's like different surfaces that we haven't really captured as much as we could have. We might actually want to go out eventually at some point to like Europe and like get some more diverse data. Um, so, you know, that's, that's definitely been like a limitation, I guess you could say, you know, and then even just like playing abilities um, it's really important to just have like diverse data. And so you wanna, especially for like, if you're doing an application in sports, like everybody has different techniques and uh, even just looking at like a forehand, like everybody hits a forehand very differently. So, you know, the initial idea that we had was just like local recreational players, but we missed out on a lot of data for like college players early on. So like, for example, we didn't have any data of like serves that were faster than like hundred miles per hour which is um, very common in college tennis, but extremely uncommon in like recreational mm -hmm. tennis. So that was something that we had like a lot of bias on was like just this, the, those small things actually like make a big difference in like the AI's ability to track stuff accurately. So now we're doing a better job of that. Now that the app has expanded in scope, we now try to get more diverse data. We have so many, we have like 80 college teams now paying and using the product. So we have like a ton of data coming from those teams now. So I think it's, it's gotten easier over time, but I think Sometimes there's just no way around it. You're gonna be a little, you're gonna have some bias in your data initially, but hopefully if you can find a path to like scaling up your data set, then you can improve on the diversity over time. Um, and it's similar to like Tesla too, you know, like when we started out, we mainly had customers in like North America. Most of the data was like North America, like rich suburbs, you know, people who could afford like the Model S. But then once the Model 3 came out, it was more affordable. You started to get a lot more diverse data. You got rural footage, you got footage internationally. So it's a similar kind of thing. I think every company that's building their own proprietary data is gonna go through that process. Um, but it'll get solved over time as you just scale up. Yeah. Um, I mean, just relating to that, again, like this bias and like accessibility, I was wondering um, whether, like, I also know that Swing Vision is like deemed as Australia's official um, tennis like ball tracking app and I was just like wondering because you collected data in California how it's <laughs> being I guess used there and also just in terms of like player accessibility um, because you did mention your target audience was like casual um, tennis players have you like tried going into like professional um, like tennis like Olympics and stuff like that yeah so well I guess on the first part um, the good thing, yeah, Australia is pretty similar to the U.S. <laughs> for most parts, <Okay. laughs> um, which is which helps. Um, it's mostly hard courts out there as well, and so like yeah, at this point like that we have I think enough diverse data that it hasn't been too much of an issue. It is a bit weird that like the U.S. Association still hasn't like partnered with us yet. We're, we're working with them on it, but they just they work really slow. The Aussies are like really really innovative. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, and then um, in terms of accessibility, yeah, we've. We've definitely expanded in scope from like the adult market. So we have a lot of juniors, like high school students using the app now, which is great. Um, especially like the highlights feature, like you can create these highlights. Now you can even like post them on like TikTok. Like it'll, it'll convert like your landscape video into like a vertical video. It's pretty cool. And it'll like follow the ball left and right. So people have been really having a lot of fun with that. So I think that's been pretty cool. Um, but yeah, we haven't really gone up to the pros yet, mainly because of like accuracy. Like if you're a pro, you are looking for like just a small change in like any improvement you can make. It's very marginal. Um, so for, I'll give you an example. So um, are, is anybody familiar with like Andy Murray? He's like a number one British player former. So I literally have a WhatsApp uh, message history with him, thread with him um, talking about Swing Vision because he was trying to use it uh, to improve his serve. So he was trying like different rackets and he was trying to see if like switching from one racket to another would give him like an extra like half a mile an hour on his serve. And so I was like, well, that's like smaller than our margin of error. So like you probably can't use swing vision for that. Um, so, you know, our error is like five miles an hour or something. So he's not gonna be able to detect a half a mile an hour difference. It's gonna look the same. So, you know, for, for, for pros, it's like they're looking for such small changes that like our technology isn't accurate enough yet. I think it could get there eventually but that is like some of the limitations of like using just like the one camera solution, you know? So that's why it's like, it's really geared more towards like amateurs where like you're not looking for like that small of a change. You're just trying to like literally just hit a better forehand, like just get it in, you know, it's, it's just, it's a very different level, I think. Um, 
But uh, over time, maybe it could happen. Um, and then also over time, we might build a solution that's multi-camera or something like that, where like if you're a pro, like money isn't an issue for you. So like you're willing to set up like a bunch of devices or whatever. So like there might be something like that eventually. But I, I do suspect it's a pretty small market though, because it's like you just have a handful of pros at the top, whereas like you have like millions and millions of individual mm -hmm. uh, athletes, right? So I think that's kind of like what we're more focused on right now. It's just like that bigger market and like serving most of the world. Um, yeah, I mean, talking about market in general, like that you guys are like spo focusing on tennis right now. Yeah. Is there any like I plans to extend to other sports? Yeah, definitely. So um, we're actually gonna expand the pickleball this year. Oh. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, so it's it's really similar. It's growing like crazy. Um, uh, it would be so easy for us to go to it. I mean, the ball is like moving half as fast. It's like twice as big, all this stuff. So um, it's, it's like, yeah, for us, it's a piece of cake. Like the AI is, you know, it's gonna have no problem. Um, yeah, after that, um, we're still trying to figure out what we wanna do, but I think at some point next year, we'll start expanding to like non-racket sports potentially. So I think for me, like baseball is pretty high up. Um, we've just been getting a lot of demand for baseball. It's a really big sport, at least here in the US. Um, it's another one where you can kind of see everything from one angle. Like if you just put the camera behind home plate, you can kind of see everything that's important. Um, you can see the pitcher, you can see the, who's batting, like everything. So I think um, that might be the first non-racket sport we do. Volleyball is like another one that's been requested. Um, like I think I'm, I'm meeting actually this Friday with like the captain of the USA volleyball team or something. So like he wanted to chat about swing vision. So, you know, stuff like this. So like people will reach out. Uh, and so, yeah, that's another one that's interesting. I'm not as convinced on like how many people play volleyball, but I know it's a really popular sport as well. So we're still trying to assess it all. Um, yeah, it's it's hard. Like we're, we're trying to see should we focus on sports that are big in the US, big internationally. We're still like mostly in the US, like 60% of our revenue is coming from the US right now. So that's kind of the focus for now. But obviously eventually you want to be like a big global brand. So, you know, we hope to go to other sports, maybe like ping pong or badminton, but those just aren't as big here right now. Um, but yeah, clearly lots of opportunity. It's good. It's been one of those hard decisions, like what do you mm -hmm. focus on, right? That's, that, that's gonna, we're gonna go through that over the next year. Yeah, I mean, talking about like plans for next year, what is like the future for Swing Vision? Like what do you see for yourself maybe like six months or just down the line? Yeah, I mean, well, well, six months from now, I hope we have a pickleball app, but um, <laughs> <laughs> <Should be Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> five, five years from now, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm hoping we can become like as big as Strava. I mean, I think we'll, we can become bigger than Strava, honestly, but I think like that's where I want us to get to is like everybody who's playing ball and racket sports is like recording their game, they're streaming it, they're, they're tracking it, they're sharing with Swing Vision. That's really the goal, um, you know, and that... I think we want to just basically bring this to as many sports as we can where it makes sense. Like I probably wouldn't make swing vision for running because that doesn't really make sense unless you have like a drone following you or something, <laughs> right? But I think like, you know, ball and racket sports, that's going to be like our focus. And I think just like slowly expanding to every sport one at a time as it makes sense. And, you know, hopefully we're serving like as many sports as possible, um, you know, five, 10 years down the road. That's like the long-term goal for the company. I have a very a completely unplanned question. So a uh, lot of uh, is, a lot of the Indians here, especially, play. I'm sure they play cricket. Oh yeah. Uh, and you have coming. you also played cricket by any chance? <laughs> you have. Sorry, so. no, I do not play cricket. Um, uh, yeah, I don't watch it either. I was gonna oh. say my parents watch it, but that doesn't really help. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I have a cousin who plays. Oh, he lives okay. in Cupertino. <laughs> He's really good. He's like nationally ranked. Um, wow. No, but yeah, I know. Yeah, cricket's obviously massive sport in India and like right. other parts of the world. So yeah, I think that would be also like a, a good one to go to eventually. Right. I think again, like with that one, um, you know, we have to have a better like international strategy. We mm -hmm. have to be on Android. We're iOS only right now. You yeah. know, that's not going to work, right? <laughs> so I think like some some things need to click there still uh, before we could do it. But I think that's also a very big sport. I would. I mean, I would probably argue it's as big as baseball. If you just look at like global numbers, it's probably as big. Um, so I think like that would be that would be a good one to do eventually too. So maybe to say transpose the problem into a sport like cricket. Yeah. How would say, or maybe baseball if that's more convenient for you. How does the <laughs> computer vision? Sorry. How does the computer vision process work for baseball? Like the, it go go through the technical process through with us. 
how would someone start, say, building a model using data? Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it'd be pretty analogous to how we did with tennis. So mm -hmm. I'd go and like collect a bunch of footage of baseball games. Um, you know, we'd probably have to figure out like where the camera's gonna go. That's actually the first decision you have to okay. make. Um, because like with tennis, it was pretty easy. Like you're just gonna stick it behind the play one of the players on, on top of the fence. Um, with baseball, there's like a bunch of different places you could put it. My suspicion is like we'd probably want to put it behind home plate because you can see everything. Because you want to be able to see everything from like one angle. I don't know what you'd do with cricket actually, because like you can't really just have a phone just like there in the middle of the field. <laughs> that's true. It's kind of awkward. True. It's probably gonna get knocked over at some point. Yeah. So yeah, that's a bit. That's a tough one. Um, but yeah, with baseball, it's easier. You have this like big yes. cage right behind, right? So like that's that's a little bit easier. Um, so I would just like pick an angle, collect some footage. If it looks good, start collecting a lot more footage um, and then start labeling it. Come up with like, what do you want to label? How do you want to label it? And just kind of go through that same process, you know? So, if, and, and the big thing with, with tennis was like figuring out what events are important. So with tennis, it was actually pretty easy. It's just like anytime the ball gets struck by a racket mm -hmm. or it hits the ground or it goes into the net, those are all important events and we don't care about anything else. So I think you could do something similar with baseball. It's like anytime somebody pitches the ball, it makes contact with the bat, it like lands on the ground or goes over the fence or whatever, like those are all important. But then I think with baseball, the secondary thing is you also need to know when anybody's running from like one base to another. So there's like, you might have to do some player tracking actually, because mm -hmm. to do basic things like highlights, uh, you're gonna need to know a little bit more than just what's happening with the ball. So I think there's like some additional stuff to label there, but that's like the basic process I think that I'd probably go through. Nice. So uh, maybe going slightly behind into like non-sport, non-technical stuff, but I want to ask you about your time as a PhD student at Columbia. Uh, so people have mixed views about the PhD. People, <laughs> yeah. some, some people think a PhD hampers their career. Some people think it's useful for their career. What is your opinion? And you did a PhD, so you're biased, but still. <laughs> well, it's funny because I had a friend like a few weeks back who asked me about this he's he's a software engineer and he was trying to get into like the ai space and computer mm -hmm. vision and he's like hey do you think i should get a phd i was like no do not get a phd <laughs> i was like you can like learn this on the job like ai is not that hard you can pick it up in like six months probably less um and he didn't and now he's like a lead engineer at an ai startup so it's like okay. you, you don't need you know so I, I think it's just it depends on what you're trying to do mm -hmm. so for me when i was an undergrad like Going into my senior year, like I had no idea what I wanted to do after I graduated. I knew I maybe wanted to be a data scientist, but that was like very early at the time. Like that phrase and that job had just started, um, and the, most of the positions required a PhD. So that was one thing. Was like, okay, if I look at all the job descriptions, the ones that I find interesting, they all require a PhD. So I probably need to get a PhD. So that was like one thing. The other was that I really loved teaching, and I knew I wanted to teach again. I already knew that when I was an undergrad. So that was another thing was like, I need to get a PhD if I'm gonna teach again, especially at the university level. Um, so that was the main reason I did it. Uh, I went through the process, I did not enjoy research. It just wasn't for yeah. me. Um, it was just too slow paced for me. Uh, you know, very, very long like cycles before anything gets like published. Mm -hmm. I, as soon as I did the internship at Tesla, I got hooked on like that instant gratification, like just like write code and ship it and it's like so fast. Right. So for me, like I enjoyed that. Um, so yeah, I, I regret some parts of the PhD just cause like, I didn't really enjoy the research, but I think like um, the experience of solving those problems made me like more analytical. I think that was very helpful. Having the patience to like push through and grind through those papers, that's actually been very helpful for my startup uh, because mm -hmm. it is a grind. It's like a marathon, it's not a sprint. And so like, I think a lot of those non-technical skills I feel like you, that you develop, it, you get pushed to your limits sometimes. And like, that's very helpful uh, in, in other completely unrelated things. So I think like, the actual stuff I did my research on was like pretty useless for Swing Vision and for Tesla. It was like completely unrelated. But I think just like the process of going through the program, going through like the papers, the dissertation, the defense, all that, uh, all very useful and translatable. Um, but I would just say like, yeah, in general, I wouldn't recommend it unless like you are trying to go to academia. Like you know for sure you want to be involved in academia in some capacity, whether it's research or teaching. That's the only reason I'd recommend it. If it's to like gain a skill or learn something, just do a master's or just learn it on your own. Because like at this point, there's so many resources online. And also you're at Berkeley, so like you have amazing classes as an undergrad. You could probably learn what you need as an undergrad. But I think right. if you don't think it's enough, there's a lot of resources online as well. Yeah, if, if you're motivated enough, I think. So one of those amazing classes is incidentally taught by you. 
<laughs> which is which is data eight, and we are curious uh, what led to you becoming a lecturer at Berkeley, and oh, yeah. why data eight. Maybe that story. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so when I was an undergrad here, I took Stats 135 um, with Professor Adhikari. Um, so this was like probably 12 years ago or something. Um, and yeah, I, I did pretty well in that class. Um, and we, I used to go to her office hours all the time. We kept in touch. She advised me through the whole process of my grad school application. So I was originally trying to go into econ. She actually like convinced me to go into stats oh. <laughs> selfishly. Um, but I trusted her advice. I went into stats. I'm glad I did. Um, and then, yeah, I just kind of kept in touch with her. I just like updated her every now and then, any time like any progress was made. Like, hey, I got an internship at Tesla. Just want to let you know. Like, thank you so much for everything. You know, just like small emails here and there. And like, yeah. professors love that. Like, they love getting emails from students who have done well. Like, and like have achieved something. Like, they're they're like your cheerleaders for life. So like, you should do this. Like, if you're in my class, like, tell me what happens with your life. Like, I want to know. Okay. <laughs> so please, like, don't Note feel this bad. Down, people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, send me an email. Like, I love it. Um, so yeah. So she was always just like super hyped anytime. Like, I had any sort of incremental progress in my career. And then, um, yeah, came back to the Bay Area, my PhD, worked at Tesla for a couple of years. And then when I uh, left Tesla to work on my startup, then I realized I had like more control over my schedule. And so then I reached back out to her directly. And I was like, hey, like I've, I've always wanted to teach like an intro stats class. I'd love to st teach stat two or something like that. Um, and she's like, no, 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 you gotta teach data eight. That's the new thing on the blog. So I was like, okay, what's data eight? Um, and so she sent me like the, the textbook that she wrote with Professor Wagner and Professor De Niro. Yeah. And I read like two chapters of it and I was like, wow, this is exactly how stats should be taught. Like people have been doing it wrong for like decades. Like this is incredible. And I was just so blown away. Um, and I was like, yes, please. Like I want to do anything I can to help with this class. And so that was basically what happened. And then she just kind of got me through the fast track to teach this class. Wow. Um, so yeah, very, I think very lucky, but um, it, it helps to stay in touch, I guess. Okay. Yeah. So, uh you are the lecturer of arguably the world's largest undergraduate data science course. You're also the CEO of Swing Vision. These seem like two insane <laughs> work giving jobs. Yeah. How do you manage this? And, and I, you are very smiling and happy. I, I don't know whether that's a show. <laughs> is, that a, is that a show for today? Or is it, is it, the, is it the case that uh, these two things are really draining you? Somehow, you just gotten used to it. Oh my God, that's so funny. Um, <laughs> genuinely funny, I'm not making it up. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, doing a triple major helped me somewhere. No, um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, no, but, but actually though, like, I think just doing, like pushing myself constantly to do like a lot of things, I think has helped with my time management. So I think I, I got it down now. But um, I don't know, it's just fun for me at this point. Like. I just I, like I consider data like volunteer work. Like I just love it. It's okay. just so fun. Like I love, I, I love like getting up there and lecturing. I love the office hours and like getting all the questions. Like for me, it's just like a dream. Like I'm having so much fun, and that's that's what I felt at Tesla too. Like I was saying, like I had such a good time there because I just love the product. I love the team. I love what I was doing. So I think that's it's rare to have that in life. I feel very privileged and fortunate. But I think that if you have that, it's just it's so true. Like it doesn't feel like work. So like. Data eight does not feel like work to me ever. I, I love it every second of it. And then um, Swing, you know, it gets stressful sometimes um, because you're CEO and like you don't want the company to run out of money and you're always like trying to fundraise and all this stuff. So that's like super stressful. But like there's so many moments of that where it's still like very fun and um, just looking at like this amazing team that we put together, the the feedback that we get from customers, like it's just so cool to see customers like so mind blown that your product like exists and like they think it's like magic. So. I think like all those little things like keep you going, um, but yeah, I mean it's it's hard, it's stressful. Uh, you definitely have to like pick and choose your hobbies when when you're doing a lot of stuff like this, you know. So like I don't have that much free time, but if I do, I'm like spending it with family or whatever, my wife and stuff. So um, you know, but I think uh, that's uh, it's just I guess something over time I've just gotten good at like time management or something. I don't know. Okay. Um, but it's not it's not as crazy as it sounds, especially day eight because like we have such an incredible staff and they do so much of the work. Like I just kind of show up and talk and then go back home. Um, so <laughs> like they're really doing all the hard work. It's the staff, honestly. Like they support everything. Um, you know, the class wouldn't run without them. So uh, yeah, I think it's all kudos to them. Um, but no, it's 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 been good so far. I'm I'm keeping it going. I think like 
if and when I have kids, like I'll have to drop day eight, unfortunately. <laughs> it'll be it'll be pretty hard to do like three things, but um, at least from what I'm told. But uh, up until then, um, I'll I'll do it for as long as I can. So, so if you haven't taken data eight, take it right away, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm on the clock. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, just going off that because you were like you're working in an academic as well as like a workspace environment at the same time, right? What do you think? Like we're all hopefully gonna graduate. Um, so what, what advice do you think like students should take in like the transition process? Oh, like from graduation to yeah. like starting a job? Oh man. Um, I mean, I would say while you're here, just like really enjoy this time. Like you're not getting this time back. Like just college is just like such a great time. I feel like, I, I, I mean, some people might find it really stressful, I'm sure, but like Overall, like that freedom that you're having right now, you know, it's just you're gonna have all these other responsibilities like pile up, just like life stuff afterwards. So like, really cherish this time, cherish this campus, this amazing campus, uh, make the best of it. And then I would say also like, I would highly encourage you to take some time off too. You've all been grinding like the last four years, four plus years, some of you. Um, you know, go go travel, go spend time with family, do what you have to do. Don't jump straight into work. Like you have the rest of your life to work. You know. So that's that's the other advice I would give, honestly. It's just like take a little reset, enjoy your time. Um, you've just by coming here, you're already set up for success. You've already done all the right things, you know. So I think that would be like my main advice, honestly. If there's like one thing, that's what I would say. Yeah. yeah thank you so much. Um, and just like in general, like I hope, like I think a lot of students in this room are like data science, CS, like each students. And I personally face this problem of like, they all like seem similar to me and like they seem <laughs> like the job aspects seem similar to me. What do you think is like a way to narrow down what one should do and like, yeah. Oh, uh, that's a good question. I think it's gonna be hard to do that un without actually working in the job. Like some of it's like, you're just not gonna know until you try it. Um, I think the best like proxy might be to just talk with people who work in the positions that you're applying to. Um, talk to the people who work at these companies, like reach out to them, just like direct message people on LinkedIn. Like sometimes people will respond. Um, and I think that, you know, just try to get a sense of like what projects they work on, like what keeps them excited, like why, what keeps them excited to go to work. Like I think that will give you a little bit of a taste of like what it's like to work there and like what kind of problems they're working on as well. But a lot of it, it's just, it's hard. Like you're not gonna know until you go do it. Um, and then, you know, hopefully you like it, and if not, you can always switch, do something else. But, yeah, there's no shortcut on that one, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. So, uh, this is, we're going to start a very fun segment, which we do with a lot of our events, right from politicians to Bollywood personalities to tech CEOs. We always ask some rapid-fire questions, <laughs> and we hope they'll be rapid and full of fire. Uh, <laughs> I'll try. To, to start, to start off, maybe okay, the the first one. Okay, this was also not planned, but I still want to ask you. Uh, you have really notable investors: Andy Roddick, former world number one; James Blake, who also top U.S. player and was incidentally the tournament director of Miami, which just concluded. Yep. Uh, yep. And one more, which I don't think I should <laughs> disclose right now. Uh, how did you get these investors? Really big names. Um, just like through friends that I knew, like I had a friend in high school who ended up becoming professional, became 600 in the world, so got to James Blake through him. Mm -hmm. And then once I convinced James to become an investor, then he's really good buddies with Andy Roddick. So then he introduced me to him. I actually, funny story, like I also met John McEnroe. Oh. Um, when I met Andy Roddick, I actually pitched to John McEnroe and like he was not interested at all. Um, and, then, <laughs> and, um, and I met Jim Creer, who's like another American legend, and he was really nice, um, but didn't invest. But Andy was the one who ended up investing. Um, so, yeah. Wonderful. Shall we fire yeah. the next question? <laughs> I mean, I guess what was your favorite subject in school? Uh, which, like high school or? Yeah. Yeah, high, yeah, high school. school. Oh, man. I think bio, actually. I really love oh. bio. <laughs> oh. Yeah, right? Isn't that weird? Yeah. No, I love. It was so funny. So my wife's a, my wife's a pediatrician. So she was asking me something about um, about the anatomy of, of the human body, and like I knew like all the answers, and she was shocked. I was like, "Yeah, dude, I crushed AP Bio. Like that was my thing." Yeah. So I was like, I was ready to be a doctor. Like I was good to go. 
But then um, we did like this pig dissection and I was like almost fainting and I couldn't have it. So <laughs> I knew everything, but I couldn't keep my eyes open or like I had to close my nose. Like, I don't know, something, the smell, the, the visuals, it threw me off. And I was like, I can't, I can't do this. But yeah. <laughs> so the same question, but translated to Berkeley. What was your favorite class at Berkeley? Oh my God, favorite class at Berkeley. Damn. Um, I, I would say um, I took a game theory class in the econ department with mm -hmm. David on. I was incredible. Also took micro econ with David Card, who ended up getting a Nobel yeah. Prize, which is epic. And so that that class is so good. Uh, econ 101A, amazing class. I love that class. Um, it was just like one of the coolest applications of calculus to like real life decision making. I guess the third one would be like Stats 134 because I just love calculus and like that was one of the first like really cool examples of like multivariable calculus like combined with probability theory. I don't know, my mind was blown, I loved it. So those, those are the top ones for me. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, today morning you were mentioning that you were like here like after 10 years. Like in this, in, in this, this oh yeah, in, yeah, inside here, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so just going off that, what was your favorite like library to study on campus? Um, I was not too much of a library person actually, unfortunately. Um, I don't know, I just like like studying in the dorm. I'm like, super boring. Uh, but like my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, like yeah, she used to go around to the library, so I'd like go with her. I was like, okay, fine, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm like forgetting the names, but but I know there's like one inside. Um, Do I think it's like the Morrison or something. Yeah. yeah. And it has like the fancy like leather chairs. Yes. Yeah, yeah, like, okay. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, that's the one. I like that one was cool. But oh. that's all I remember. <laughs> Nice. Um, yeah, actually, I also, I took uh, machine learning in one of these rooms down here. It was either this room or, like, one of the other rooms on this floor. That's basically the last time I've been inside this area, this section oh. of campus. Okay. So it's been a while. <laughs> so does that remind you of good things or bad things? The machine no. learning class. It was good things. Um, <laughs> man, I forgot the name. of oh, John McAuliffe, I think, was okay. the professor. Yeah, and he used to make, like, a bunch of Seinfeld jokes. I don't know. That's all I remember. <laughs> but it was a fun class. Uh, the next question would be, since you're, you are a tennis fan, if you were to take a tennis lesson with a legendary player, oh, man. who would it be? <laughs> I mean, it'd probably be Roger. Like, he's my favorite. So, nice. yeah, I have to say him. <laughs> I've seen some of those single-handed backhands in Swing Vision promo videos. So, but I know uh, what's yes, the inspiration. Yes, definitely inspired. I mean, that's, like the racket, that's the racket he used to use in, like, 2012. So, yeah, I'm a big fan. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, so the last line of code I wrote for Swing Vision was this evening, oh. five oh. minutes after office hours. Oh. I was at FSM, uh, and then I was just like grinding away. I was like working on some code. Yeah, so I still code sometimes. Very rarely, but it happens. Do you like still do debugging? Yeah, I was literally fixing a bug that we just released to production, which is like classic. But yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. So I just I just fixed a bug this afternoon. Um, so yeah, it was fun. I still like doing it, and I still review code. So yeah, still involved a little bit. Uh, I, the next question would be: While you were at Berkeley, what was your go-to meal? Um, so my wife and I we used to go to Narai Thai all the time. Um, or not Narai Thai, sorry. Uh, that's in SoCal, my bad. Um, thai basil, Thai basil, oh, right? Oh, okay, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I got it mixed up. Yeah, Thai basil. We used to go, like, I remember Fridays. I don't know, she had some class, like, organic chem or something. And then we just, like, went off and, yeah, had Thai basil. That was, like, our go-to spot, I think. We all love that. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you, like, have any role model or inspiration? Um, I mean, used to be Elon. But, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I guess these days it's hard to say. I haven't really thought about that in a while. But I think when I was, like, yeah, I definitely when I was um, in, I think when I was in high school, it was probably, like, like Steve Jobs. I think when I was in uh, grad school, it was probably Elon at the time. Um, yeah, now I don't know, I guess. Now, now I just look at, like, I guess other, like, startup seats. Yeah, I mean, that ends the Apple music. <laughs> Yeah. That's fantastic. So we have been speaking quite a while, but I also see some eager faces in the audience. Uh, let's open it up for audience Q&A. If anyone is interested, just fire questions at us, please. Okay, so um, first of all, congratulations for the project and I think it's uh, every time I see a project that takes us as fortunate to get closer to a performance actually, that's like pretty cool. Um, in terms of business, you mentioned the expansion strategy that you had in terms of projects. 
but if you look, again, I don't know how accurate the current page numbers are, but you guys are a pre-series A, you have raised three million dollars in total so far, so that's your two million, something like that. <laughs> how can you make sure that you're gonna be able to expand and be bigger than Strava, <laughs> uh, using your own words, in the next few years with such a tight budget? Is your plan to like raise more money? Is your plan to like go profitable? What is the business strategy? Yeah, so um, we actually just closed our Series A. <laughs> okay, <laughs> a few thank you. A few weeks ago. Um, so yeah, it's going to be a combination of raising more money, um, but also uh, we are very close to break even. Um, we're almost profitable. So I'm hoping by, you know, we're going to hire really aggressively right now. We just like doubled the team. So now we're not that close to profitability. But I'm hoping like from a year from now we'll be like profitable. And at that point, it's really up to us. If, if we're growing really quickly and we continue to maintain that profitability, then we can scale super fast. If not, then we'll have to just raise more money. But I think at this point, it's looking like it's becoming easier and easier for us to raise money because the company's doing so well. But I think like, um, yeah, so I think it's gonna have to be a combination of either like more funding rounds or just becoming massively profitable and like growing super fast. Um, but yeah, we definitely need more capital to do that because those companies are massive, so yeah. Oh, any more questions? Yes. Uh, do you, are you looking to expand into more uh, sports as well? Like apart from just triathlon? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think you came in a little late. But um, yeah, we, we are definitely planning to expand. We're going to go into pickleball this year and then like hoping to go to non racket sports like baseball and volleyball and things like that eventually. So yeah, long term, we, we want to go to like as many ball and racket sports as possible. Please. I have to think very carefully. No, I want to answer. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna shy away from it. But I just need to I need to think carefully about how I say it or what I say. Um, I'm just like going through all the topics in my head right now. I mean, maybe bootstrapping. I don't know. I feel bad saying that because Professor Artikari like is obsessed with bootstrapping. <laughs> Um, it's just like not something I really use. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I think that's probably, that's probably the least favorite. I'll go with that. I, I, I like like almost all the topics, but I think that's, if I had to pick like a least one, it's that. And then favorite topic, um, I love talking about classification, um, especially cause that's like so related to my work. So I love those lectures. It's super fun. Um, so yeah, that's, and then also the causality one, even though it's at the beginning, I, I like that lecture a lot. It's a nice example. So. Yeah, good question. <laughs> oh, any more? Yes, please. <laughs> Sorry, what's that? How did I get through Stat One Thirty Five? How did I get through Stat One Thirty Five? Um, I don't know. Just like showed up and did all the homework. <laughs> sat in the front row. <laughs> just like the usuals. I don't know. <laughs> Nothing too special. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, it was a hard class, though. I mean, especially because, yeah, I, mean, I remember that Professor Artikari, like, the, that final was really hard. I did not do well in the final. I, I actually aced the midterm, and then I did not do well in the final. And she was like, really? Like, oh. but it was, was there fine. a reverse clobber? <laughs> no, there wasn't a reverse clobber. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was funny. She was a little bit bummed. She was like, come on. You set, up, you set yourself up so high. Like, she was expecting me to, like, do really well in the final, and I did not. But maybe I got too confident. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, yes, please, please, you can go ahead. So, um, in terms of data privacy, right, like, so we see GDPR in Europe, we see yeah. the specific behavior here in California, how do you think that can impact the fact that you're recording the tennis players for so many people? Yeah, that's definitely, I mean, a concern, I think. Um, what we're trying to do is, like, just take video from people who like have public profiles because you can set profile privacy settings in the app, right? So, you know, that's one thing we're trying to do. And then we also try to avoid taking footage like if you're like under 13 and stuff like that, you know, I think our default privacy setting is private for that anyway. But that's that's like mainly how we're getting around it. And then also we have um, kind of like, you know, terms of service that like when you're using this product, like we actually own the video footage, you know, we have like the rights to use it. So like you're kind of agreeing to that when you're using it. But I, you know, we also just try to make sure like the, the access to the data is like locked down, like it's all through like pretty secure connections. Um, you know, we don't want that footage like going out outside of the company as well. You know, and don't want it to like leak and all that. So I think we're still in the figuring it out phase there. <laughs> 
um, as a startup, but I think that's going to become really important as we become a bigger brand. Yeah, that's a good question. It's a tough one. I don't think we've totally solved it in the right way yet, but it's going to become more and more important. For sure. It's certainly difficult to get. Yeah. From yeah. my own experience, uh, I can say that. What What do you think? Uh, do you, should they be? Um, are discussions enough, or do yeah. should lectures also be smaller? Yeah, I mean, I wish lectures could be smaller. To be honest, um, if you know, if I could clone myself, I'd love to have like a <laughs> bunch of lectures, you know, and just like give everybody that one-on-one -on -one support. But yeah, it's just hard. Like we just don't have the resources. I think. It's a really tough trade-off because you know we can make it smaller, but then a lot more, a lot less people actually get to access the content. Um, so you know, it's it's just it's so tough with like the constraints of like a public university, especially with the budgets that we have. But I would say overall, like it's better to continue expanding just so that more people can at least take it and experience it, um, and then at the same time just try to like expand the number of discussion sections that we have. You know, I think that's where it'll really help. Um, but even then, it's tough. Like, I mean, we'll have students who, who are, you know, they're working, like, multiple jobs. They can't access, like, any of our office hours. Like, I feel terrible about that. So it's just, it's so tough. But I think, we, I definitely think we could do a better job of just having, like, more flexible, like, office hours, like, more flexible discussion times. Like, I'm sure there'd be some TAs who are willing to do some really weird times just to accommodate people, like, in the evenings and stuff. So um, I think a lot of those changes still need to be made. Um, but it's it's uh, it's gonna be challenging. I don't know. There's a lot of changes happening right now, also with like um, the union and like all this stuff and the bargaining that's going on. So classes might shrink actually. So it might actually get tougher to, to do that. But um, which I totally understand. But I think uh, it's just unfortunate for students. But we'll see. We'll see where it goes. I'm I'm glad that we've been able to like just open up the class to so many people though at least. Um, but yeah, no, always always room for improvement for sure. Um, I mean, I guess it might be hard. I don't know if like there's, if we've started to see like application related classes like this, like ML applications and like other, um, and other departments on campus, but that'd be one way. Like you might have some classes in other departments where it's like, you know, ML applied to like this particular field or this particular problem. So like if we have something like that, that would be a good way to do it. Um, just to get a little bit more experience. But a lot of times those departments aren't really like set up for that. So like research groups might be like another option. Um, so a lot of times you'll have research groups in other departments where they're looking for like the person who knows the stats or the ML and like they're not the experts. They're like very desperate for like some talent to help them. So like that also could be an option. Like you could even try just looking at like the research projects that people in other departments are working on and see if there's anything like even remotely related to stats or ML or data science and like just throw your name out, out there, email them and see if they need any help. Like maybe they could use you know, some help. So I think that could be like one way to try it too. But um, yeah, it's, you could definitely be a little bit creative about it, um, I think. But those are, those are a couple ideas, I think. No, actually, um, I I mentioned this thing earlier, but I was super risk averse. Um, even when so even when I was at Tesla and I was like I had already raised money from like Andy Roddick for Swing Vision. We had already raised like two fifty k, and I still was like very hesitant to leave Tesla because I was just so risk averse. I was like, oh my god, like what's gonna happen if this fails? Like it's gonna look so bad on my resume or whatever. Like I don't know. Like you don't know what's gonna happen. I'm just gonna like, waste a year of my life working on this thing. So I was like really not wanting to do it, even at that point, up until that point. I had already raised money for it and everything. I already had like a kind of an early version of a product. Um, so yeah, I think for me personally, it was very hard to become a founder. I never thought I would do this. I never imagined in a million years I would have been a founder. I just, I'm not a risk averse, I'm a super risk averse person. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, I was just having a lot of fun working on it and like my family was super supportive. 
um, my wife, my girlfriend at the time, was like pushing me to do it. She's like, you should just leave it, leave Tesla and do this thing because like you're, you're having so much working, so much fun working on it. And it's a very unique idea and like no one's done it. Like you should just take a shot at it. So I just, I had the family support, which I think was like very encouraging. And like that allowed me to like take that risk. Um, and you know, I had the privilege too that like I was able to forego my salary. Like I didn't pay myself for two years, not ever paid in that position. So, you know, I was lucky enough to be able to do that. Um, so a lot of factors, but yeah, short answer, did not think I was gonna do this. Not a chance, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, um, I was just wondering, like, what are your thoughts on, like, generative AI and, like, more business models, and also, like, what are, like, opportunities that you see it in this, like, growing space? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to see. I mean, it's it's uh, it's progressing so quickly, I think, just, like, the rate of the innovation, I think, is what's uh, really um, surprised me the most. Um, I've, like, played around with some of this a little bit. For me, like, the coolest part, I mean, I'm, I'm like, into, like, computer vision, so I love, like, video-related stuff. But I just love like the, the idea of like generative video. Like you could just make your own movies now. Like that's just so cool. It's gonna be so so easy to make content now. Um, so I think that's really exciting. And I think you'll start to see the quality of movies get a lot better, a lot faster. Because right now we're like, any movie that comes out, it's like within the constraints of like Hollywood and like who they pick. And like they'll just pick the actor that like looks the best, but like sucks at acting. And like now you won't have that. Like you're gonna have an an actor who's actually amazing at acting, right? Like it's all just fake and it's all AI generated. But I think like. Just the quality of content, I think, is going to get a lot better, which I think is pretty cool. That's a, just one of the interesting applications of this generative stuff. Um, but I think in general, just content, you know, in general will get better, like written content as well, um, like news articles, like all that stuff. Books might get better too, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to really evolve like the creative process for a lot of people. Um, I don't think it's going to replace humans, but I think it's going to vastly accelerate their ability to make and, and democratize their ability to make really good content and like anybody will be able to do it even if you don't have a lot of resources. So that to me is like the most exciting potential. Um, we'll see how it goes. It's moving really fast though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, has, it hasn't impacted us at all, honestly. Um, yeah, you always see startups like trying to chase the latest trend. I remember when like NFTs were going up the rage like a couple years back. One of our investors reached out to me. He's like, "Hey, are you guys gonna find a way to like integrate NFTs into Swing?" I was like, "No, like we're just well, stop. Like, let me focus on what I'm doing." So, no, like yeah, for me it's just like we're just focused on our problem. We're focused on our market, and like if this new technology comes around and it ends up being like kind of helpful for what we're trying to do, then sure, like we'll adopt it. But I'm not gonna try to like force a way to like insert this into our product unless it's like actually gonna make it better and like for our customers. So like chat GPT like maybe could be useful if we ended up wanting to make some sort of like a chat bot client or something like where you can like chat with like an AI coach or something like that maybe, maybe. But even then it feels like a little force relative <laughs> to like our current roadmap. Like it's just not the right time. Like we're, we're focused on other things right now and like we'll insert it later if it makes sense. But that's like the way we look at it in general is like there's always new tech, there's always new technologies coming up and like new trends and stuff. And um, I think it's it's very easy to follow that because you'll see these startups like adopt it quickly and like raise a bunch of money. But like most of the time they just crash and burn and like don't build anything useful at all. And I think for us, like we've built a real product. It actually generates revenue. It's actually almost break even. This is actually going to be a sustainable business. So for us, it's like let's just keep doing things that are that are working there. But then. Um, yeah, if something comes along the way and it's useful, like sure, you know, definitely consider it. But I think we we try not to like just jump on the next thing, I guess, um, just for the sake of like being on the latest thing. Yeah. Oh man, favorite? Oh, Carlos Alcaraz for sure. Alcaraz, Car Carlos oh. Alcaraz. Yeah, I'm a big fan of his. I just love his like movement on the court and very fun to watch. And I was like. Very sad that like Roger's retiring and Serena's retiring and like oh what's gonna happen but um, he's so fun to watch I think he's gonna bring in a lot of like non tennis players into the sport so that's exciting. Yeah, I mean I think it's a good thing overall. Like uh, it's just like the internet became a larger part of more people's lives, right? Like initially it was only accessible to people who like knew how to program and like write code, but then uh, over time, computers became a lot more accessible and easier to use. Like, I think it's the same thing with AI. Like, it's just gonna become more and more accessible and easier to use. 
Um, I'm really excited about like the potential of like robotics as well um, to just like improve like everyone's like daily life and like I think eventually everyone will have like a robot in their house that's doing like all their chores for them. Like I think it's going to become super accessible. I think that's like the path to like universal basic income and all that. So I think like I think it's very exciting. Um, I guess the only scary part about some of it is like initially it feels like uh, it might it might only be accessible to like the people who know how to use it properly. And that's typically people of like higher income or higher education. So you might have this like gap that emerges initially where it's like people who know how to use it are able to like really take a lot of advantage. But I think that gap will go away quickly because like the technology will become very accessible very fast. And so even if you don't have like the background knowledge or like the, the resources or the money, like you will be able to still take advantage of it. So we'll see. But I think overall I am excited about it, I would say, rather than scared about it. Yeah, oh man, that's a tough one. Um, there's a good South Park episode about that, by the way, if you haven't seen it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's so tough. I mean, I think like it's so important to have like just like original ideas and original content. So um, there's definitely a balance there. I can see some situations where like it's really great that like students can use this now, but then there's also some situations where it's like going to be a little bit problematic because you're not able to actually demonstrate your understanding of the material and you're not really actually learning anything if you're just having this thing like spit it out for you. So yeah, it's gonna be interesting to see. I mean, even in a class like Data 8, right? Like you could start looking up stuff on ChatGPT probably, right? And it'd be pretty hard for us to catch it. So I think like that's problematic. So I think we do wanna get to um, a place where we can probably detect some of those things and have some sort of like verification that like this was definitely like submitted by you and like original work by you. Maybe someone needs to build some sort of verification system or something. Um, I think ultimately what you'll find is like, we might have to start moving towards a lot more in-person assessments that are like no, like no tech assessments, like basically like handwritten assessments. Um, we might have to move sort of back towards that if that's like the only reasonable way to actually assess like people's knowledge of things and like the actual work they're doing. Um, and so like you're gonna have to write code by hand or something like, you know, I'm just, that's like the limit of like what happens. But I think like if it starts to become really bad, like we just won't have homework assignments anymore because like what's the point? Everyone's using ChatGPT. And so it's like any assignment you do, you have to do it in person and like submit it in person, which like does not sound fun, but like maybe that's the only way, I don't know. So it'll be interesting to see like how things develop. But I think at least like for a class like Data 8, we have in-person exams. There's no way to really like get around that. You're not gonna be able to use ChatGPT no matter how hard you try. So you know, you're not gonna be able to fake it at that point. And so that's when it's gonna catch up to you. So I think there'll be enough ways, hopefully, that there's like consequences to just like skirting around it. Um, but yeah, we'll see, see what happens. <laughs> no. Short last one, yeah. Um, so uh, I was looking it up and initially the argument was similar for chat GPT. Hmm. And uh, he said they don't want students to be using chat GPT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Their assignments right, right, right. Yeah, that's a good point. Do you think that's ever going to happen with ChatGPT or AI in general? Or yeah, I think I think they'll happen for some fields for sure. Um, especially like anything like computational, um, maybe even coding. I could see it happen eventually. Um, but yeah, you could imagine with like the calculators, right? Like a lot of that math you might have had to do by hand at the time, and now it doesn't make sense to do it by hand because like if you're working in an actual job, you would never do it by hand. You would just type it on the computer. So I think like anything like that, where like in the actual job you would be using chat GPT anyway, then that's probably where it would just be accepted to do that for the assignment. I guess you'd probably just remove the assignment at that point. Um, so I think it'll be something similar to that where it's like, okay, this is actually like the way things are done in the real world anyway. Um, so we have no problem with it. Um, and therefore we probably don't even need to assess it either, so. whether or not if I can actually take the videos for the day 140 textbook after I, after I graduate. And then she mm. started to talk about very proudly of her, one of her students who <laughs> <laughs> talked with her talk, like a lot and then who came back to teach. And 
I just realized that and I was really um not not just now but like I really felt elated that I was doing um yeah (laughs) and also a question like that I had was adding on to about like A_I and how how the potential of A_I there was like a letter that asked for temporary halt in like for their development in A_I oh yeah right mhm like that was signed by like Bloz um Steve Steve Wozniak Wozniak and like also Elon Musk yep so cool with the A_I yeah [laughs] yeah [laughs] that's so funny [laughs] [laughs] yeah so like what what are your thoughts on that like Steve Jobs also we had to stop for a while like a little bit so we uh yeah interesting um yeah I didn't get a chance to read that letter um but yeah I I'm sure there's some very legitimate concerns there about some of that I think that my biggest concern there is just like the lack of like regulation catching up to some of this stuff um I just think like the government is very slow to react to some of these things and like it's just moving so fast that like it can start to become dangerous like especially with so one of the dangers of like AI generated video content is like you could just fake whatever you want and I could just make like present Biden say like whatever I want and its gonna look completely real so that's extremely terrifying and so I think like we need to have some sort of regulations some sort of like protocols around this like verifications um you know maybe it's the blockchain I don't know what it is but like something like I think there needs to be some technology developed that will at least like allow us to verify like what's real or not I think that's where the biggest concern is gonna come right now I don't think it's like uh you know Terminator situation where its gonna like take over us or anything like that we're not there yet we're still like I think a few decades from that but I think like just you can use this for like a lot of harm right now uh pretty soon so yeah I don't know if slowing down is really gonna work though cause like people will always keep developing new stuff like it's very hard to stop development I think but it's much easier to introduce regulations um and like introduce laws and policy that feels a little bit more feasible um so yeah but hopefully the government responds quickly I don't know and starts working with like the tech industry to come up with some policies that's probably the best solution yeah [noise] [noise] you know on sort of like a lighter note I was kinda curious if you have any like funny stories that you have from your development like submission or something like that all in the process [laughs] um yeah I mean I guess yeah well one of the one of the craziest things that happened was um so when we were working on the first version the MVP uh when we first started working full time in twenty nineteen so we like collected a bunch of data labeled it we trained our first like neural networks and we trained it in Python using Pytorch which we still do that today that's like our main thing um and then we had to convert it into um CoreML which is the format that's used for running machine learning models on the iPhone and um the conversion wasn't working like the the model was working fine like you'd pass in an image uh or like a video clip and it would process it properly we converted it to the iPhone format we ran it on the phone and it was like not working at all so it was just like incredibly stressful time we're like running outta money we did not have a product yet that's making money so it's like very stressful um we're looking online on all these forums like stack overflow everything like no one's figured out the solution to this problem because we're one of the first people in the world like building this um and so yeah it was like several several weeks of just like looking online hunting forums and then finally like our ML engineer like tried one he just ran like one line of code differently [laughs] at the model conversion step and then everything worked after that so it was crazy so stuff like that [laughs] stuff like that happens a lot um so there's just like some funny memories like that another one is with um with Andy Roddick like when I met him um he uh we we met at like a professional like it's it's like a exhibition event like he's not a professional player any more but he was playing an exhibition event with like John McEnroe and all these guys um and so like yeah I talked with him for a bit we were in like the locker room like before he was like gonna go out to play his match in the stadium court so we were just in the locker room the whole day and than he had to leave at the end of the night to catch a flight back home we were in Texas and he couldn't find his iPhone um and he was like kinda panicking um and this is the first time I'm meeting him right so I'm I'm here for like a business meeting but I would just kinda thought of my I was just like thought of the first thing that came to my mind and I was like well I think I can use find my iPhone to find your phone so I so I had my laptop so I was like you wanna just like log into iCloud on my laptop he's like are you sure I was like yeah sure so so he he did it he logged into iCloud I could see like all of his devices [laughs] and then it was so weird like I saw his wife's devices like his wife's iPhone like all this stuff um and his wife's like kind of a famous model so it was like funny seeing her name on my on my laptop and than I like found his iPhone and 
And oh, and then the other thing was, um, uh, one of the other players uh, like tried to call his phone as well, and, it, and no one could hear it because it was on silent. So he was like really screwed. Like his phone's on silent, you can't call it. Um, but yeah, so then he logged into iCloud, and then I clicked on his phone, and, it, and you can like play the sound, and it played the sound even though it was on silent. So then he actually found the phone, um, and it was like in the corner of the room somewhere. So he got it, and he was like so thankful, and he came up to me. He's like, "Are you in Venmo? I'll Venmo you 50k right now." So um, I mean, he was joking, but um, but he did invest 50k eventually. But uh, <laughs> but it was pretty funny. So uh, yeah, I guess the tech skills were useful that day. So. <laughs> Yeah, well, OpenAI was supposed to be open source research, and then somehow they switched that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like we're still kind of far from AGI. I mean, it is pretty creepy seeing like Boston Dynamics and like all those demos. Like those creep me out. But um, I don't know. I still feel like we're still so far because, like, it's so like explicitly like designed all the modern AI models to do like very specific tasks. Now these tasks are getting like a lot more broad, I guess. Um, but I think we're still very far from like an AI being able to do like its own thing completely autonomously. Like it's all still like programmed to do this specific thing with like a lot of human input. So I think like sooner than like AGI would just be like just people like controlling the AI to do like things that look like AGI, but it's not really gonna be. It's still gonna be like humans putting in input, I think. But it still feels like, I don't know, we're still a little bit away from that. Um, Cause it's a really hard problem to solve. I think we're still, Far. It feels like we're closer and closer, but I think we're still, still a ways to go. I don't know. I guess no one really knows. <laughs> uh, I think it is time now, and uh, we also know that you have a company to run and a class <laughs> to teach. So we, we will let you go, but can we have one huge round of applause for Professor Sir? <laughs> thank, thank you so much for thank you so much for doing this. The, conversation was so insightful. I am pretty sure that this one hour, one hour, 15 minutes, we learned so much, <laughs> especially how you got your investors, how, you, how your journey at Berkeley began. Very inspirational. Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah, thank you guys. Thanks all for staying so late. I uh, appreciate it, but uh, really enjoyed the questions. So, yeah. Okay. It's a wrap, folks. Thank you so much. Thanks.